Right, well, I think, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and for Steve for inviting me to talk um, here. And I'd like to begin my presentation um, with what's usually at the end, a little bit of acknowledgement. And, uh, and so although I'm giving this talk, a lot of this work was done uh, with Jose Alberto, who was a postdoc in my lab at the time and kind of spearheaded a lot of our, our ketogenic diet studies. And then also Megan and Zay Yu, who are graduate students, and Jennifer and Trina, who are scientists um, working with our Mouse Metabolic Phenotyping Center and helped us with a lot of this work. Uh, my goals for today's talk really are to give a little bit of background on how I became interested in ketogenic diets. And along with that, talk a little bit uh, about um, ketone signaling, some of the, the work that, that Eric Verdon was going to talk about, just introduce it a little bit because Eric and I have kind of overlapped. I was familiar with Eric's work and some of Eric's work with ketone signaling, and that helped kind of shape some of our ideas on the, that there might be some uh, cellular mechanisms beyond just utilization of ketones as a fuel that might affect aging. And so I want to start with that and then give a little bit of an overview of, in summary, of our studies uh, in animals with ketogenic diets and aging, and then finally end with some areas that I think are key points or areas that need to be addressed to get a fuller understanding of how ketogenic diets might affect aging and, and potential uh, steps to move forward with these diets. So I became interested in ketogenic diets uh, through uh, studying calorie restriction. And calorie restriction has been kind of the gold standard for aging research. So it's an intervention that for over 100 years has been known to increase lifespan in laboratory rodents and has been shown to increase lifespan in a wide range of animals from yeast up to dogs and um, potentially monkeys. And I became interested in calorie restriction work over 20 years ago. And at first it was an interest in trying to understand when animals or humans go on weight loss diets, the energetic uh, adaptations and metabolic adaptations that tend to work against maintaining weight loss. And then I was introduced to calorie restriction as it relates to aging when I began postdoctoral work with, with Rick Weindrick. And part of the question then was, are some of these adaptations that occur with weight loss, that potentially occur with weight loss, also important for aging. And my original interest was trying to look at, at whether these uh, energetic adaptations might be influencing the increase in, in uh, lifespan with calorie restriction. I also, around 2000, had Kavor Kagopian was a scientist working in my lab, and he is an excellent biochemist who is very interested in intermediate metabolism. And one of the questions that he was looking at is when animals go on calorie restriction, after they've lost weight and become weight stable, are there still metabolic changes that occur with them? And so he was looking at all the major pathways of intermediate metabolism and published a series of papers. And these are data from one of the papers looking at uh, glycolysis and regulatory enzymes of that, like um, glucokinase, phosphofructokinase, pyruvate kinase. And what he was seeing is with both relatively short-term calorie restriction and very long-term calorie restriction in older animals, that these animals never really, uh, uh, they, they didn't return to uh, levels of these enzymes or activities similar to um, control animals. There was some level of adaptation or some difference that persisted with them. And so this decreased capacity for glycolysis in these animals. And this was a, a slide that he prepared and it was kind of summarizing just some of his work and this idea that the metabolic pathways within these calorie restricted animals were shifted in a way that they were kind of poised to use fatty acids and ketones as a fuel source and had a decreased capacity for using glucose. And that had been one of the questions that we had had is, are these metabolic changes important and are they something that may be influencing aging in these animals? And in particular, when looking at ketones, uh, we were look, interested in the kind of ketogenesis pathway in, in liver and this idea that, um, that this pathway is, is changed with calorie restriction and kind of chronically um, upregulated. And so, and then producing the, the primary ketones, acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate, which are 
um, interconvertible through beta hydroxybutyrate dehydrogenase. And so that was one of the questions. Is it the shift in metabolism, or is it possible that it's some components of that shift in metabolism, and particularly ketones, that might be playing some role in, in aging and changes we're seeing with calorie restriction? And this is, is also some of, of Kevork's work, and this is just looking within liver. Um, and these were calorie-restricted rats that were started on the diet at six months of age. And so what we had seen in those animals is that there was a chronic increase in total ketone, acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate levels in liver within these animals um, from both short-term calorie restriction all the way out to long-term calorie restriction. And kind of along with that, um, there was, we'd been doing, in addition to the biochemical work, had been doing a lot of work with indirect respiration calorimetry and primarily looking at energetic adaptations to calorie restriction. At the time, we were also getting respiratory exchange ratio data. And for those of you who aren't familiar with indirect respiration calorimetry, the respiratory exchange ratio gives you information about substrate oxidation. So values down at 0.7 are utilization of, of lipids as a fuel source. One, carbohydrates above one are uh, lipogenesis from carbohydrates. And although we had seen this data, it had kind of uh, changed our focus, this paper that had come out from Mark Hellerstein's group that was looking at calorie-restricted animals and saying, these animals typically consume very high carbohydrate meals, 60% of calories from carbohydrate. And yet, what they do, the typical way of feeding these animals are given one meal, they eat it rapidly, they convert much of that carbohydrate through lipogenesis into lipid and rely heavily on lipid as a fuel. And so that was kind of the purpose of his paper. And when we were thinking about that, we were thinking, yes, and they also become ketotic. Are all these changes important? And this kind of finalized these questions, like, is this shift in metabolism towards lipids? Is increases in ketones, are those important? And if you could achieve this without weight loss, these shifts in metabolism, could you have an impact on aging? <laughs> and one of the things that helped with this was this idea around this time with aging, this interest in potential mechanisms through which ketones could potentially, or shifts in metabolism, could impact aging. And one of the things was, during this time, we'd learned a lot more about energy sensing pathways. And these, um, are thought to play a very important role in aging and, and the functions of calorie restriction and potentially ketogenic diets. And in particular, with aging, there's been a lot of interest in mTOR pathway, and so rapamycin, an inhibitor of that, is one of the interventions, the first intervention from NIA's Aging Interventions and Testing Program that's been shown to, to change aging. There's also interest, interest in metformin and effects on AMP kinase. And so part of the idea was that ketogenic diets produce many of these same changes that you see with, with calorie restriction. And so they might be working through some of these energy um, sensing pathways and inducing changes in metabolism that can affect aging. The other thing which made us kind of zero in a little bit on ketones was this idea that there was all this emerging information that ketones were actually signaling molecules, that they were doing something more than just serving as a fuel source that was being shuttled from the liver to the rest of the body for use as fuel. And so now we know that there's a number of, of functions that, that ketones can do, and that these give potential mechanisms through which they could be changing gene transcription and changing function of proteins and potentially affecting aging. And one of the things that have been noticed is that there's two um, uh, cell surface receptors that uh, ketones are ligands for these receptors. So the first HCAR2 receptor or the niacin receptor. And so there's been a lot of interest in the effects that um, ketones may have on this and effects on decreasing lipolysis and adipocytes, effects on inflammation, gut in integrity. And so um, that's one option is that ketones could be having effects through that. The other is through the free fatty acid receptor 3. And originally thoughts were that it was primarily an antagonist or inhibitor um, for, for this uh, receptor and that that might be part of the adaptation to starvation or calorie restriction. 
things that help decrease sympathetic tone through that way. Um, there has been some recent d data, though, that suggests that this isn't always the case and that it may actually stimulate this receptor, at least under certain circumstances. So there's a lot of interest in this receptor-mediated possible functions of ketones that are going on now. And then one of the other things that we saw, and this is Eric Verdon's data from Eric Verdon's uh, paper, is that Eric was doing some work with, with ketones and looking at histone acetylation. And he published this really important paper in science in 2013. And part of it was this idea that beta-hydroxybutyrate itself was um, affecting histone acetylation. And histones are proteins that then influence gene transcription. So this was providing a way that histones that, that beta-hydroxybutyrate and ketone bodies could be um, producing changes in gene transcription and also providing a potential mechanism um, that they could influence physiological function and, and aging. And one of the interesting things with this paper was that he was noticing that you were seeing changes under physiological conditions. For example, under fasting, he was looking at uh, um, acetylation at two different lysines, 9 and 14, and histones and seeing an increase with fasting and also an increase in calorie restriction in rodents. And so this kind of fit with this idea that there could be something going on when you have this shift in metabolism that's beyond just a change in, in energy utilization but could be affecting way, um, pathways that, that can affect the function of the cell. And so this has been kind of the general um, idea with, with beta-hydroxybutyrate at this time, that it's a histone deacetylase inhibitor. And so beta-hydroxybutyrate can go in and, and particularly inhibit class 1 uh, histone deacetylases, and in this way change acetylation of these histones, which in turn affect gene transcription. And so in particular, HDAC1 and 3, there's um, convincing evidence for changes uh, for, for beta-hydroxybutyrate inhibiting those. There is also some um, evidence of effects on, on possibly class uh, 2A, at least one HDAC. And some of the important genes that we're just kind of beginning to understand, some of the genes that might be changed by this process, but there's a few, FOXO3A, brain-derived neurotropic factor, FGF21, PGC1-alpha. These are all genes that have been talked about for potential roles that they may play in aging. So it's very nice then to see that, under this case, the beta-hydroxybutyrate may be modulating um, the expression of these genes. And one of the final things with um, signaling functions or functions of beta-hydroxybutyrate is how it's affecting post-translational modifications of proteins. And so one of the ideas that as beta-hydroxybutyrate is metabolized, it forms acetyl-CoA, and this acetyl-CoA can be a substrate for protein acetylation, and we now know that uh, virtually all of the proteins in the mitochondrial um, uh, intermediate metabolism are acetylated, and many of the important proteins with metabolism undergo acetylation, and we don't entirely know what that does to most proteins, but there's thoughts that it may be regulatory in the way that phosphorylation, dephosphorylation can be. The other thing is that when um, beta-hydroxybutyrate is metabolized, it consumes succinate, and so there's been some sub, um, speculation that it may decrease protein succinylation, which is another regulatory step. And finally, some of the more recent data has also suggested that beta-hydroxybutyrate itself can attach it to proteins, and in that way can potentially change the function of some of these proteins. So there's all these kind of exciting areas now um, on ways that beta, that ketone bodies and beta-hydroxybutyrate can affect metabolism beyond just serving as a fuel itself. And so that led us to the key question of, does a ketogenic diet have an effect on aging? And at the time when we were considering this, there was a fair amount of work that were suggesting that high-fat diets have a negative effect on aging primarily because of, of weight gain. Um, but there wasn't a lot of studies, or we couldn't really see studies with really long-term ketogenic diets, or even studies that were using high-fat diets that were fed in ways to uh, restrict intake or prevent um, obesity. And so we thought these types of studies needed to be completed, and that it was time to kind of take a look at 
at these types of diets and see if shifts in metabolism through diet um, could, could have an impact on aging. And so when we were considering these studies, we, we kind of had a few goals um, for the diets. And when sitting down with Jose Alberto, we had said, one, we want to start the diets in middle age. We want to look, use uh, middle aged animals at a time when many humans would make a diet change. The other thing is we didn't want the diets to cause weight gain. There was already plenty of data out there about effects of different diets, um, and especially high fat diets with obesity, and we didn't want that, that component. We also didn't want the animals to lose weight. We weren't trying to, to do another way of studying cal severe calorie restriction. And we also wanted to divide, devise a couple of diets. One that would induce an increase in fatty acid oxidation, but not cause continuous ketosis. Because we were still very interested in, is it important just to shift towards fatty acid oxidation, then the ketones aren't necessarily important. And the other diet that we wanted to do was do want, uh, develop a diet that produced animals that were in sustained ketosis. And so um, that was our goal, was to basically to take a diet, take a middle-aged animal, feed them in a way that we basically maintain that middle-aged body weight through the rest of their life. And when considering diets, there's many different ways that we could have gone. And I think this is an important area when we're looking at these, whether we're talking about human studies or animal studies, is that just saying something is a low-carbohydrate diet or even sometimes a ketogenic diet, these can be a range of different diets, and they could have different types of effects. And so we had to carefully consider what type of diet we were going to use. Um, for our control diet, we decided to use just a standard semi-purified diet that we had experience and others had experience with lifespan studies. So we had a control where we knew that we could get reasonably long lifespans with animals. And so our control diet was just an AIN, AIN 93G diet. And so in this case, a little over 60% of calories from carbohydrate, roughly 20% of calories from both um, protein and fat. We used the same ingredients and then just manipulated the diets for low carb. We had 10% of, of calories coming from carbohydrate, and this was enough that these animals weren't um, ketotic. And then our ketogenic diet, 90% of calories came from, from uh, fats and 10% from protein. Um, and the animals were fed 11.2 kcals per day. This was an amount that we had to adjust just to make sure that the animals maintained middle-aged body weight. Um, for our study, we had a, a couple of, uh, of goals. One was the question on what effect do these diets have on lifespan. So we had a group who that was their whole goal was to measure age of death and at death to be able to do uh, histopathology and look at cause of death. And the other um, component were our cross-sectional cohorts, which I think in aging research, this is an area that's become critically important. In the past, one of the gold standards was, could you find an intervention that increased lifespan? Now, there's a lot more interest in saying not can we increase lifespan, but along with that, can we increase measures that show that health is being improved, that you're creating an older animal that's healthy, not just that you're extending lifespan, and along with it, potentially um, um, increasing time at which an animal is impaired or experiencing age-related disease. So we had two cross-sectional groups, one where we were looking at just short-term, um, kind of acute time on the diet in middle age, and then the others where we are looking at um, older animals at 26 months of age. And so we had a number of different goals within these studies, and one of the first was, did we achieve what we were looking to do? And one of them, why are we getting these dramatic shifts in substrate oxidation? And the other question that we were having with these diets is a lot of people assumed with it, these high fats that we were going to get negative impacts on body composition. And so we wanted to take a look and see what really happens in these older animals to body composition. And the first, using indirect respiration calorimetry to look at substrate oxidation. Again, a value of 0.7 is almost complete reliance on lipid as a fuel or lipid and ketones. Values of, of 1 are carbohydrates. And what we saw was 
with our ketogenic diet, that the animals basically just maintained metabolizing ketones and fatty acids. It was almost a flat line. Our low carb was intermediate to that. When you fed them, they had some spike, which was showing increase in utilization of the carbohydrates and some of the protein. And then they rapidly then went back down to fat. And our control did, as you'd expect. They ate big meals. They mostly relied on carbohydrates. They had some level of lipogenesis that was occurring after that. After they'd consumed all of their food, they, they um, went to using fatty acids as a fuel. And we also achieved our goal of looking at continuous ketosis, the ketogenic diet even after a meal, they maintained ketosis and were significantly higher than the other two groups. And as far as body composition, um, what we saw was with, is with fat mass that there was no differences between the ketogenic diet group and the control group. Our um, low carbohydrate group was significantly heavier than the other two groups. Um, we don't entirely know why we have some, some um, guesses as to why that may have occurred, but because of that, they had significantly increased fat mass. When we look at lean mass, the ketogenic diet animals were able to maintain their lean mass throughout the aging. Um, and what we saw is that the low carbohydrate group had a higher lean body mass. They were also bigger animals. Um, and the control group, their lean mass went up at very late life. And so there was a significant difference between the ketogenic group and the other groups. And so one thing that we wanted to take into consideration is that some of these lean body mass changes in these animals, because this is including all of lean body mass, including internal organs, that some of these changes aren't desirable, and some of the increases in lean body mass that may occur under these cases may be internal organ changes that are reflecting some level of pathology. And so when looking particularly at skeletal muscle, and this is skeletal muscle adjusted for body weight, what we saw in the 26 month or the old ketogenic animals is that they'd maintained lean body mass and compared to the other groups, they had comparable or greater amounts of the major skeletal muscle um, within the hind limb. Um, so the next big question um, that we were faced with had to do with um, lifespan. And so that was what most people were asking, what effect were these diets going to have? And we had colleagues who were making um, all kinds of suggestions, and many of them thought, you know, that this was going to be a relatively short experiment. And, um, and so, you know, we were quite interested in seeing um, how this would, would play out. And these are the lifespan curves, and um, there was a significant difference where there was an increase in lifespan in the ketogenic compared to the control using log rank tests. There was about a 13.6% increase in median lifespan in the ketogenic diet group. The low carbohydrate group was a little bit interesting because it was kind of intermittent, intermittent to the other two diet groups. So it straddled between the two and wasn't significant different from either the control or the ketogenic. So one of the things was that, that when these animals died was doing necropsy and, and histology on them. And one of the most striking things about these were changes in tumors. Um, there were some other pathology changes that, that were observed, but uh, one of the things with mice, and particularly C57 black 6, which you used for these studies, is that the primary cause of death in these animals uh, are due to tumors, and in particular histocytic sarcoma. So about 50 to 60 percent of these animals typically will die of cancer, and particularly histiocytic sarcomas. Um, and one of the things that was noticeable on necropsy with the ketogenic diet was how few of them had tumors or had visible tumors that could be detected. And so the first side is just showing total tumors. This includes both uh, sarcomas, but it could include also adenomas. Um, we also had some mast cell tumors and a few other different kinds. Um, and so this is also including tumors that weren't likely cause of death and may have not contributed major pathology, but just looking at total, and in this case, some animals could have had more than one. Um, but the ketogenic diet was lower than the others, and for the major type of, of cancer within this type of mouse, um, we had one out of 10 um, ketogenic animals that showed that tumor, so it was, it was striking, because the other groups all kind of hit the pattern that you would expect for this type of mouse. And so um, that was one of the pathology changes that, that was, was very clear um, with animals on this diet. So 
the next um, things that we really were interested in, we thought it was, it was very interesting that there were changes in lifespan, but the bigger question now that was coming out were, were these animals healthy? So were we getting increases in lifespan? And um, what we'd wanted to do was try to take a number of different measures of tests uh, of, of health in these animals um, and, and try to get kind of a broad, uh, a broad assessment of how these animals were doing and at the same time, though, not trying to overdo um, what we were exposing these animals to. And so one of the first, uh, one of the things that we wanted to look at was effects on cognition. And the test that we used for that was novel object test. And what the novel object test does for mice is it's basically, um, it, it recognizes normal behavior in a mouse that if you put a mouse into a new environment and then give it a couple of objects, it'll explore those objects. And the test is that what, if you take that mouse out of that environment, put it back in and change one of the objects, is the animal going to be able to remember that the object has changed? And if it does, the natural tendency for the mouse is to spend a little bit more time exploring the new object. And so that's what this test was, was uh, focused on. And this is a test that has clearly been shown that, that, um, that memory decreases in mice with age. And that's what we saw in this case, that with the low-carbohydrate diet, there was a significant difference. There was a strong trend towards a decrease in performance in this test also in the control group. No age-related change in the ketogenic diet group, and the ketogenic diet group did significantly better than both the control and the low-carb in this test at 26 months of age. So in these older animals, at least with this test, evidence of increased memory um, performance in, in these animals. And these are areas where we're expanding these tests now and looking at other different regions within the brain and using more tests to to look at, at effects on late life um, memory. The other is we had a series of tests that we wanted to look at motor function and, and muscle strength. And one of the typical muscle strength studies that's done with, with, um, with mice is grip strength. And it's basically just taking a force meter that has a bar attached to it. The mouse grabs a hold of the bar and then the mouse is pulled until it releases the bar. So an evidence of, of ability to, to to uh, strength to be able to hold on to the bar. Um, in this case, uh, there, were, there was one change that occurred in middle age with low carb compared to the control diet. Um, the control diet, there was, as expected, uh, an age-related decrease in muscle strength. Um, and the ketogenic diet group had significantly better performance in this, in this measure of muscle strength compared to both the low carb and the control group. Another test that, that um, is done is hanging wire test, which is a measure of both muscle strength and endurance. And essentially what it is, is a wire is placed, the mouse is put onto the wire, and its ability of mouse to support its weight for a period of time, in this case a three-minute uh, three test. And as, as you noticed in, in middle-aged animals, they all did great. They basically all completed the full amount of tests. And this is one of the tests where we saw the most striking changes with age. And so with advanced age in both the control and the low carbohydrate diet, there was a dramatic decrease in performance in this test. Whereas with the ketogenic diet, we didn't have a significant decrease in their performance from middle age, and they did significantly better than both the control and the low carbohydrate group. Another um, test that we looked at is called the rearing test. And this is one where animals are placed in a clear um, a cylinder in an environment. And, it, and it's based on normal mouse behavior to want to explore and along with that to kind of move along the cylinder and be able to rear up on their hind limbs um, as part of exploration. And what we saw again with this, and this, so this measures both a willingness to explore but also the coordination to be able to rear up on their hind limbs. Um, limbs. And in this case, there was also a trend towards an age-related decrease in the control group, and in this case, the ketogenic group did better than the controls at 26 months of age. And then one of the kind of the final like physical performance tests that we did, um, or that I'm going to show you uh, today, is something called the locotronic ladder test. And what this is is basically a coordination test. And so it takes a mouse that's in a, a brightly lit area, 
there's a ladder that separates that from a darker area where the animal wants to move, and it basically measures the ability of the animal to run across that ladder and get to this darker area where it wants to go. And so the faster that an animal can complete this task, the better. And in this case, all animals performed similarly well in middle age. With advanced age, there was increased kind of in this performance with the control group, and that the ketogenic di diet did significantly better than the control, and that they were able to complete this task in a, in a faster amount of time, in a shorter amount of time. So in addition to those measures of physical performance, there were a number of other um, kind of tests that we wanted to complete just to give an overall all idea about health in these animals. And one of them is, uh, particularly with aging, is inflammation. And so there's no doubt with the advanced age in animals, you see increase in markers of inflammation. There also tends to be an increase in variability in inflammation, which reflects um, kind of changes in pathology within the animals. And what we wanted to do was select a series of markers of inflammation, and, and the three that we selected were ones for which there had been quite a bit of evidence that these change in mice in response to different interventions. And so we tested those. In middle age, um, we didn't really have evidence of increased inflammation in any of the animals, and, and the diets behaved similarly. At 26 months of age, we saw, as been reported in the literature, that there were age-related increases at least in TNF-alpha and CXCL1 um, in, in the um, control animals, no significant age-related increases in, in the ketogenic diet animals. And the other thing with ketogenic diet animals that we noticed is we just didn't see the variability that we typically see with aging in other animals, so much tighter data. And the next thing that, that we had a lot of questions about was what was going to happen to serum um, markers of lipid metabolism within these animals. And these are data from 26 months of age. And what we saw was really no significant differences. The groups all behaved pretty similarly. The only difference was really um, with free fatty acids and that the low carbohydrate group had higher amounts than the other um, groups. But the ketogenic diet um, had similar values um, and if anything, maybe a trend towards higher HDL cholesterol than the other groups. And the final area where we haven't really done that much, and in meetings where I get a lot of questions are about insulin signaling, and particularly looking more within the cell at kind of cellular um, measures of, of insulin signaling, and questions about whether we're seeing long-term changes in these animals. Um, we haven't done the cellular work, but what we did was do the general glucose tolerance and insulin tolerance test. And in these, um, animals are given an IP injection um, of glucose or given uh, glucose and insulin for the insulin tolerance test. And what we saw is after these animals have been long-term on ketogenic diet animals, they were somewhat glucose intolerant. There was a significant difference um, in glucose tolerance tests compared to the other groups. But the interesting thing was when we did an insulin tolerance test, these animals had still maintained their ability to respond to insulin. And so our general thought was <laughs> the glucose tolerance test effect was just reflecting the fact these animals hadn't seen appreciable amounts of glucose for a long period of time and were maintaining very low levels of insulin. So they had somewhat an impaired ability to respond when given this big glucose bolus. But when given insulin, they still perfectly responded to it. So then this set up kind of the last part that I want to talk about in the, in the remaining uh, minutes of this talk, and these are some of the key questions that still remain. And one of them has to do with mechanism, and so that's been a lot of the focus. There's been a lot of interest in trying to narrow down mechanism and to try to determine if, if you can write a grant and figure out something where in five years we can figure out the mechanism for how this works. <laughs> And I'm a little bit skeptical on that because I think this is a diet that's having massive changes in metabolism, and I think it's multiple mechanisms that are contributing in different tissues. And we tried to take a look at a few of the, the mechanisms that have been proposed. And from an aging standpoint, one of the most important ones is this mTOR pathway. So this is an important pathway for protein synthesis and growth, and it's an area that's of great interest for aging because 
rapamycin, which inhibits this, this pathway, has been shown to increase lifespan. And so we looked at that. And in liver, what we saw was that just phosphorylation of mTOR, there wasn't a significant difference. There was maybe a trend towards ketogenic diet being higher. But if you looked at downstream um, indicators of mTOR activity, so phosphorylation of 4-EBQ1 or RPS6, what we saw is a significant decrease with the ketogenic diet, but also a difference that occurred with the low-carbohydrate diet in, in liver, and also a, a, a trend towards a decrease in RPS6. We looked at DDIT4, which is an inhibitor of the mTOR pathway. That was significantly increased in, in the ketogenic diet. So we had some evidence that the ketogenic diet is having an effect on mTOR signaling in liver. Um, but this is also a complicated pathway because we didn't see these same changes in muscle. And there's still some question on which tissues are showing changes in mTOR and how exactly is that affecting response to ketogenic diet. The next thing that we looked at was protein acetylation, and this is one of the most dramatic changes that we see with the ketogenic diet, and these are data that we're showing from liver. Um, what we see is this pro total protein um, acetylation of lysine in those, a dramatic and significant increase in the ketogenic diet compared to all the other diet groups. When looking at P53, that specific protein, also a dramatic increase uh, with the ketogenic diet. When looking at histone, in this case, also an increase Interesting thing here, though, is that we also saw that the low-carbohydrate diet had a significant change, at least in that measure of acetylation. And so this is one area that we are, are focusing on that we think is quite important, this changes in, in protein acetylation with ketogenic diets. And this right now seems to be one of the, the more striking changes that we see with, with this diet. The other thing that we were very interested in was mitochondrial content, and this idea that, um, especially in very late life, whether these diets were going to help, help maintain mitochondrial mass um, and potentially mitochondrial function, and this ended up being a lot more complicated than we had thought. Um, it very much depends on which tissue you're looking at, and it very much depends on what's being measured. Um, what we saw was... In no case did we see ketogenic diet in old animals, and these are 26-month-old animals, having a uniform increase in every marker of mitochondrial content that we measured. What we would see is that it would have an increase in some, and in this case, in skeletal muscle and activities of two of the electron transport chain complexes. Um, so we saw that was variable, and we also saw at times, like in this example, that the low-carbohydrate diet um, sometimes had similar effects. And so... I have a graduate student who's working on, on this, and it's ended up being a much more complicated experiment than I had wanted, and, I, and she got a much bigger challenge than I think we both expected. The second really important question has to do with calorie restriction and intermittent fasting and, and ketones. So one of the questions is, does ketogenesis have to be continuous? Um, and this is Eric Verdon's paper that came out at the same time as our paper with ketogenic diets. And Eric ran into a similar problem that we had. Um, if we tried to feed ketogenic diets ad libitum, the ketogenic diets that we were using, the animals overate them and they became obese. And that didn't meet one of the goals. And so that was part of the reason that we fed amounts to maintain middle-aged body weight. Eric saw the same thing with his animals, but his approach to get around that is he put them on ketogenic diet for a week, put them on a control diet for a week, and so he rotated. And his goal for that was to prevent the weight gain. So his animal's weight cycled. Um, and despite that coming on and off ketosis, he did see some positive changes, um, and particularly increases in memory. And, and I show some of his data from his novel object test um, that was in his paper. And where I, I think that's important is that with calorie restriction and how I first got into this is there's usually two different approaches that people use for calorie restriction in animals. There's where the animals are fed every day, and in this case, when the animals eat a meal, they go out of ketosis, and they have a period of several hours 
eight to 10 hours, and then their ketone levels go back up. And so they're continually going through this cycle of increased uh, ketosis, um, where they go into ketosis for periods of 12 hours, maybe a day or much, and then go out of it. Um, or there's the uh, calorie restriction method where they're fed calorie restricted diets three, three days out of the week. And those they just cycle through a few days out of the week. And so part of the question is, if ketones and beta hydroxybutyrate are playing an important role in the metabolic adaptations and the effects of calorie restriction on aging, it's not doing it through con continuous ketosis under this circumstance. And so that's a big question. Is it that we that the two things aren't related and we just kind of lucked into getting ketogenic to studying ketogenic diets and that they really aren't playing a role in calorie restriction? Or is there some signaling role that these kind of blips in ketosis are playing in calorie restriction? And I think that's an important uh, question that remains to be addressed. And there's two uh, kind of remaining questions that I think are important. One of the most common questions I get with the animal diets are, which fat should it, when people are asking me about making these diets, which fat should I put into a ketogenic diet? And I honestly don't know. I mean, I've tested the fats that I've used in my own diet, but I haven't been able to test a range of fats. So I don't really know if there is an optimum fat composition for these diets. I think that still remains to be determined. And I think from an aging standpoint, probably the most important question is the last one. And, what, and that's what effect these diets have on age-related disease. Um, we're never going to be able to complete a lifespan study in humans using ketogenic diets. We can be, a, be able to do those manipulations with animal models. But we can use animal models and potentially translate that to humans um, with age-related disease. And think uh, that's the big question is, which age-related diseases are going to be responsive to ketogenic diets? When can you start them as far as in progression of disease? And which approach for delivering the diet is going to be the most effective? I think those are critically important questions um, in the area of aging. And then just to wrap up, what we've seen from our work is we're convinced now that a ketogenic diet, if it's given in isochloric amounts, if it's in a situation where animals aren't overweight, that it can increase lifespan. And also under the same circumstances, this type of diet has an effect to be able to extend physiological function maintain healthy function in these animals into later life. And I think it's critically important, kind of the last part too, is that level of intake is extremely important in animal studies and presumably in human studies too, and how a diet's gonna have its effect. Um, and so those two have to be taken into consideration together. And with that, I'd, I'd like to wrap up and, and use that just to kind of acknowledge all the groups that have played an important role in, in our studies, um, Keith Barr's lab and Marita Wallace, um, they played an important role in some of our uh, signaling measurements, and we continue to work with Keith in, in trying to study the effects of ketogenic diets on signaling. Same with Fawaz Hodge's group. He does similar work. Gino Cotopassi, who we've done some of the work with mitochondria, and also the team at the Mouse Metabolic Phenotyping Center. And finally, my collaborator, Jose Villalba, at University of Cordoba, who's done a lot of our work and is somebody that we've talked to a lot with our, our diet and lipid studies. And with that, I'll go ahead and end. Thank you.